All right, everyone, I think we're going to get started here. Thanks so much for joining us today for our live video chat about the consumer electronics secondary market. My name is Melissa Geringer. I oversee communications for VStock and will be serving as moderator for today's discussion. As we get into the chat, please feel free to use the portal on your screen to send in questions via the Q&A tab on your toolbar. You can just hover over there at the bottom. Um, we'll plan to do a Q&A at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'd like to welcome our host, Paul Bush, Director of Business Development at BStock. Paul has decades of experience in developing secondary sales channels and improving supply chain processes in the IT, consumer electronics, and appliance industries. At BStock, Paul has helped build and nurture relationships with some of the world's largest retailers, helping them recover hundreds of millions of dollars for their excess and return merchandise via our marketplace platform. Welcome, Paul. Take it away. Thanks, Marissa. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to present today. Um, it's always nice to present in a uh, format where the audience can't uh, throw things at me. It's always a nice change. Um, as Melissa said, I've got um, about 20 years experience, a little bit more than that, uh, in reverse logistics and helping to develop uh, remarketing channels for a variety of uh, clients. Um, so hopefully today you'll be able to pick up uh, some industry best practices and maybe some ideas that you could use in your own operation. Um, so without further ado, um, let's just uh, start going through the presentation. Um, so the biggest issue with um, customer returns on the secondary market uh, is returns. Um, the you know, the, the uh, return rates can uh, hit 20% uh, or higher, depending on if it's an online sale. And really it's all about some um, dissatisfaction by the user. Maybe the item didn't do what it was supposed to. It's not, they're not happy with it. It's not as cool as they thought. Uh, perhaps their significant other uh, said, uh, you spent how much on that? And uh, <laughs> back it goes to the store. So there's a variety of reasons why they may uh, return a product. Um, and, and some of them, one of the biggest ones may just be that they decide that they can't get it to work or it's not doing exactly what they thought within the first half hour or 20 minutes. Um, and that frustration very quickly leads to returning to the store. The big problem for the um, retailer or the manufacturer is that product is no longer in new or like new condition. Uh, maybe it's missing some documentation, it's missing some parts. Um, very likely it's got damaged carton or even missing a carton. Uh, perhaps it's got labels all over it for being shipped back and forth to the consumer. But for whatever reason, it can't go back on the shelf. So it comes back to your operation and reverse logistics really has three major components to it. Um, and, and all of them are messy. Um, and it's just important that this is, remains as efficient and as quick as possible to try and reduce your costs. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But number one is to provide a credit to the customer. So receive the goods, give the customer their credit, give them their money back so they can go and spend it, hopefully, uh, back in your store and buy something else. But it's really important to get them out of the transaction as quickly as possible and to document the product that's come back for your accounting and for your inventory systems. The next step is to try and figure out where it's going to go next. So this is called the triage phase, typically in, in reverse logistics. And it's really about figuring out, can I put it back on the shelf? Can I invest a little bit of time to perhaps repair the packaging and put it back into regular stock? Uh, do I need to liquidate it? Do I refurbish it or is it salvaged? So really determining where it goes next in the step. And then disposition is actually taking the action for that sort. Um, you know, figuring out all of those different items that where, where you put product and, and work on it as quickly as possible. Um, Throughout this process, there's a couple of things that you should keep in mind. Number one, uh, net recovery is kind of the key metric in reverse logistics, and you should keep track of that throughout. So that's really a very simple equation. It's what did I get back in recovery? You know, did it go back in the shelf and I got 100%? Did I have to liquidate it and I got 30%? Did I refurbish it and get 50%? So you need to figure out what did I get back from the product? And then from that, deduct all the costs involved. Uh, getting it shipped back to your location. Uh, perhaps it was uh, the manpower required to sort it and any costs involved downstream. So net recovery is something that you should be tracking throughout this entire process so you understand what it really costs you for a return. Uh, and the second thing is 
there should be immediate action between each of these steps, but particularly between steps two and three, the triage and the disposition. If you can move that product as quickly as possible uh, and it doesn't sit in storage or doesn't get moved multiple places, but it goes directly from the search stage into the action um, where it's gonna be either liquidated or refurbished or put back into stock. If you can do that as quickly as possible, you're gonna dramatically reduce your costs. Most of the customers who struggle with reverse logistics and have a costly operation, sometimes they don't even realize it, is because that product doesn't move quickly enough and they're handling it multiple times or paying additional shipping to move it elsewhere. So one thing I can really stress is make sure that your, your process is efficient and it's actioned as quickly as possible. So what happens with these uh, um, returns? You know, historically, a retailer would, uh, would place their returns in a dump bin in the store. Um, increasingly, that's kind of frowned upon. Retailers want to keep their stores as clean as possible and they don't want to have it looking junky. Uh, but it's still an option that they could uh, um, uh, look after it that way and discount it and move it out. Um, they may return items to the manufacturer. And if you're a manufacturer, you're aware of this. Um, that gives them 100% recovery and it allows them to, uh, to clear every return that comes in. Um, and then where they don't have the op option of returning it, um, you know, maybe it's an in-house brand or they've sourced it offshore, uh, they'll liquidate through local brokers. For manufacturers, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, they're really the, the, the final point where it comes back to. So they need to look at a product and determine whether can I remanufacture re that product and, and put it back into stock? Um, do I need to sell it as salvage? You know, maybe I send it to my warranty department and they strip it down for parts to be able to use as part of the warranty process. Uh, and again, they may also liquidate through local brokers. Um, the one thing on refurbishing that uh, anyone should keep in mind if they're thinking that's the a proper channel to go through is refurbishing can actually help you get additional recovery on a return. But you need to make sure that the product is of a certain size uh, in terms of retail value. Um, and also that there's a high demand for that product. You wanna make sure that you can invest enough dollars to make a difference. So if I put $30 of refurbishing into a laptop, I should be able to get much more than $30 back out of it um, in terms of my recovery. So you wanna make sure that that's number one is your, your main consideration. And also that there's demand that that product will move quickly after you refurbish it. Last thing you wanna do is have it sitting on a shelf for six or seven or eight months, and then you've got to write it down and, and, and uh, liquidate it anyway. So those two key things are important to understand from remanufacturing. And quickly on brokers, um, you know, brokers uh, have much more option to sell product than you think. Typically when you phone up a broker, uh, it's, you give, it's an act of desperation. You're just looking for them to take stuff off your hands. And when you start off with, you know, I need to get the stuff out of my warehouse or, it's coming to quarter end and, and I got to sell it or my boss is yelling at me. Um, you've handed over the power to the broker and they're really good at negotiating prices down based on what they hear from you. So uh, don't, try not to give them any additional ammunition. Uh, it's like blood in the water to sharks. Um, and in this case, you're not the sharks. So really be careful on how you um, deal with brokers and, and negotiate uh, trying to clear out product. Um, you know, I, uh, I respect the, our marketing department and really love their slides, especially the ones that are trying to keep me on track, but I'm gonna skip over this. <clears throat> I'm actually gonna go right to a demonstration of a site that uh, uh, is an option for you to use when you're liquidating product uh, versus uh, going through a broker channel. Um, so here's an example of, um, you know, a consumer electronics uh, auction marketplace. It's a uh, business to business, so they're selling pallets to truckloads. Um, up in the top left, you've got a logo. Uh, this could be uh, you know, the, the uh, retailer's logo or the manufacturer's logo to help attract buyers into the marketplace. Uh, and it, this is a standard layout that um, would be used across different marketplaces. And it, you do that so that buyers are comfortable with the interface and they can shop. But the back end is customized to the retailer or the manufacturer to the, how they want to ship or how they want to transact uh, business. Um, if you go in and uh, you know, look at one of these, uh, 
So down the left-hand side, you've got a series of menus, whether it's truckload or less than truckload, what the current high bids are, what states product are being offered, so buyers want to look locally, and also if there's a variety of conditions. It's important to note that, A, there are hundreds of thousands of buyers out there across North America for consumer electronics. Um, so you just need to be able to tap into that network. And, and the other thing is, all, there's a whole variety of conditions that they want to buy. Some will only want new or like new. Some will only want product that's unaudited returns. Uh, they don't want anyone else touching it before they get to it. Some are only interested in salvage because they're going to break it down for parts or break it down for recycling. So uh, it's important to also have your product listed by condition. We go in and look at one of these. Uh, as you can see, uh, very basic information. I can't get any more detail than this. Um, and so to be able to do that, I actually need to be able to log in. When we log in, I have to accept the terms and conditions. So these are actually the seller's terms and conditions. These can be customized depending on how they want to um, manage their website uh, and protect them, their brand or, or uh, protect against uh, channel conflict. Uh, so once I accept, I can now get the full details on this auction. Um, and there's a couple of interesting uh, things in here. So, you know, a very good description that gives a really good overview of what's there plus the retail condition, it's always good to list the retail. It tends to drag up uh, the value that you'll get when you sell. Um, you can see here that there's uh, five bids on this auction. So we have four people who are currently competing on this auction. Um, so that's always a good thing. You, you can't see who they are, but you know that you're up against someone else. So competition will drive the price upwards. Instead of working with individual brokers, and they're negotiating you down. In this case, they have no power and their only option is to sell or to buy uh, uh, the product at a higher price to continue to bid, to drive it up. Um, this has uh, you know, free shipping, but this can be customized so that uh, you can have uh, shipping costs embedded into their website so people know exactly what it costs them uh, and that can be collected. And uh, down below it has the uh, close date um, the auction site has a feature, what is called uh, popcorn bidding. If there's a bid in the last five minutes, it will extend the auction deadline by three minutes. So that means if there's five or 10 or 15 people continuing to compete, they're gonna get an automated email that says, hey, the auction has been extended and an opportunity to come back and bid more. Uh, across this network, you'll sometimes see 25 or 30% of auctions will extend and continue to collect bids. It just allows, to, allows the seller to extract the maximum value that's out in the marketplace. People are interested and they want us to get invested in an auction and they want to continue to bid and try and win it. Um, it can be customized with a series of images that shows the actual product or what it would look like when it ships. Uh, and down below, um, you know, this is the actual manifest that the client would load. It shows uh, the different product. This is a dynamic manifest, meaning that uh, you can sort by particular product that you're interested in, um, uh, or you can actually download the full manifest and take it away and look at it um, at your leisure and come back in a couple of days to bid. Um, down below, uh, more details, the actual quantity, condition, which is a really good discussion, uh, condition that uh, tells the buyers what they're looking at. Um, that's important to make sure that they have confidence in what they're gonna get. And then down below, we have a series of uh, payment information, how, how uh, auctions are paid for, how they're shipped, if, if, depending on whether shipping is not combined, uh, condition of merchandise and terms of purchase. Uh, so a really good overall way to deal with uh, many, many buyers versus having to negotiate one-on-one. -on -one. So back to you know, the benefits of using that type of a, uh, um, of a uh, business to business uh, auction site, uh, there's a variety of things. One is you should make sure that it gives you access to a large buyer network. So if you're you know, looking at that kind of a tool, it's really important to that the uh, provider can tell you that they have X amount of buyers in this particular category and they can help you access them uh, so that you don't have to do the work of finding them and bringing them to your own marketplace. Uh, the increased competition definitely drives up uh, recovery. Um, 
again, you're removing the negotiating power from the broker and putting them into a, a competitive environment where they're competing with other brokers who are looking for a similar product. Um, in many cases, thousands of brokers on a particular auction marketplace. Auctions could be very quick. You know, um, and typically three days is, a, is an average runtime. Uh, anything longer than that, and you're really not getting any additional recovery. Uh, anything shorter than that, and, and, and unless you've got a really healthy, active marketplace, it can sometimes be difficult to get the marketing out. But two to three days is a really good average that you can turn product quickly. So you're not waiting you know, a week or two weeks to sell it. It can be done in a matter of days. And you can control how the product is sold. So if you need brand control, if you need to reduce channel conflict, all of those things can be put into your terms and conditions that the buyer has to agree to. If they uh, uh, you know, run against those rules or they do something that you're not happy with, you take them out of the network and they can never buy your product again. So it's extremely important to make sure that your terms and conditions are written to satisfy what you need from the marketplace. Some critical success factors, um, why auctions work. So, you know, we talk about it drives competition, both strategically and emotionally. So we talk strategically, I can go in and I can put in a, a high bid and I don't need to watch it. And, you know, I can walk away and it will, it will continue to bid in, in small increments uh, up to the point where I put the maximum in. Um, and strategically, you can look at it and figure out, you know, what I think it's worth and put that in. What happens is buyers get um, emotionally attached to an auction. Um, you know, maybe they put a high bid in and they're winning for a couple of days. And so they start to imagine it sitting on their shelf in their store, or they've got buyers coming in who uh, their, their customers coming in and say, Hey, I'm looking for this particular type of product. So they start to get excited about that. They can sell it quickly. Um, and sometimes it's just uh, about competition. Um, they just want to win. So uh, what happens is they get outbid and they will come back and continue to drive that price up because now they want to have win that product. So auctions are really good at figuring out what the market price is and then emotionally getting people attached to them so they drive the price up. Uh, the greatest willingness to pay, and by that we mean that within a small group, there's always one person who will pay more than the other for a variety of reasons you know, we talked about. Uh, they need product on their shelf. They've got customers looking for it. Uh, they, they need to be able to buy something to be to grow. If you're in the secondary market, you uh, need to um, have additional sources of supply to be able to, to make money or grow your business. So what happens is if you get hundreds or thousands of buyers in the marketplace, you get many more reasons why they need to win that product and many more people competing to win it. Uh, so it just helps to um, uh, identify who out there is looking for it and who will pay the most. It also enables uh, velocity and cadence. Marketplaces work really well when there's a regular, um, a, a, you know, a regular schedule of auctions running. If you're taking two or three truckloads of inventory and liquidating it once a month or once a quarter, um, it's hard for buyers to get into that kind of a regular schedule because they need product on an ongoing basis. If you take that product and you split it up into four or five pallets per week, suddenly there's a reason for the buyer to come back weekly. And it's easy for them to find product uh, to source for their, their store or their online store. Um, so what that means is they start to save their cash flow for your particular auction marketplace. Uh, and that's what you want. You want to be able to build that many people in who are saving their money to come to you next week for the next auction. And then you can run regular auctions and, and clear out product quickly. Um, it, 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 you can absorb volume with minimum impact. Um, we, you know, there's, there are clients that are using this marketplace technology who are selling 100 tractor trailer loads a week. Sometimes at peak periods of the year, it's 100 tractor trailer loads a day. Uh, and they're able to find the buyers to take it uh, without, you know, using up their space or using up their cash flow. There's someone else in line right behind them because of the large pool that's out there with minimal impact on recovery. So that's another critical, important point. So... You know, the results from this is a variety of them, but you know, the, the important ones are faster sales cycle. You should be able to clear product out from the time it hits your dock to it's being paid for and, and shipped out um, within days. You shouldn't be you know, anything longer than 10, 12 days on average. And many clients are using this technology or far below that. It's a highly automated process. Uh, you know, um, basically all the administration and handling related to auctions is, is taken off the seller's plate. Uh, so they can just focus on providing a list and collecting the cash when the auction ends. Um, and it allows them to sell to 
thousands of buyers as easily as they, they can sell to one. Um, so it's extremely important that uh, you can automate your process because that drives down costs. Um, higher recovery, uh, you know, uh, statistics uh, have, over the years have told us that this type of an auction platform will drive at least a 30% recovery. Uh, and in many cases, it's higher than that. And that's based on clients' data, what they were selling for before versus what they're getting now. And that's simply, simply because uh, of the competition, um, driving people to pay more to get product that they really want. Uh, results, uh, you, can, you can have a much better um, result in terms of brand protection. Um, brokers, you know, they may be friendly, but they may not necessarily be your friends. And sometimes they will sell something uh, into a market that you didn't want. Uh, just because they need to move the product. So this allows you to have greater control over how product is sold. And the data from this uh, type of technology is extremely valuable. Um, you know, you can, uh, you can measure uh, a better uh, overall recovery on product by category. Uh, you, know, you know, what product is being returned more than other product and what recovery do I get it on the back end? Uh, you can analyze customers. If customers are returning uh, at a higher rate versus another customer, um, you can look at what is the cost in, your, in real terms from managing that customer. Or simply having a much better value of what the, the market price is on, on returns and being able to have a much more accurate access and obsolescence accrual in your financials uh, for that. So there's a, there's a variety of reasons uh, or variety of ways you can use that data. And you can sell from multiple locations. The, you know, the only people who get rich in returns are the shipping companies because they're helping you move product from place to place. Uh, you know, an auction site allows you to sell it where it is. Uh, there's no reason to move it back to a central location. Sell it out of the stores, out of third party warehouses, out of your warehouse, wherever it is, eliminating those extra transit costs. I think uh, before we go to Q&A, uh, Alyssa, just in general, Reverse logistics is an extremely important area that companies should be focused on right now. We've, we've seen that happening over the last five to 10 years. There's been a tremendous interest in reverse logistics, uh, but there's still a tremendous amount of work to be done. And I think if you can just take a little bit of extra focus and keep in mind that every dollar you save or every dollar in additional recovery you get from reverse logistics is a direct impact to your bottom line. So it's well worthwhile the effort to go through that uh, type of re-engineering. Thanks, Melissa. Back to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, all right, we had a, a comment come in about um, related to sorting by category when it comes to you know online auctions. So, um, can you talk a little bit about how sorting by category would boost pricing in that kind of dynamic? Um, sure. Um, you know, uh, in general, a lot of customers today simply mix loads. They just fill a truckload with whatever they've got just because it's expedient. It's the easiest way for them to uh, clear product out. Um, but you should keep in mind that um, brokers, when they look at a truckload of product that's mixed, there may be items in there that they don't want and they will devalue uh, what that's worth to them. Um, in some cases, not putting any value on it. If you were to take that same truckload and split it three or four ways, uh, the best categories you possibly can. So maybe it's if you've got a mixed load of tools uh, and laptops, and perhaps patio furniture. If you were to split those into the separate categories, you're gonna have people who are interested in tools and they're gonna to pay much more because that's what they want. You have people who obviously want laptops uh, and not interested in tools and patio furniture, so they're gonna pay more. So that sort will pay you, uh, you know, much more than it would as a mixed load. So it's extremely important if you can to spend a little bit of extra effort and sort the product out and attract the buyers who are looking for that type of product. Great, thank you. Um, okay, next question. Why wouldn't you just outsource the entire returns and liquidation process to one 3PL? Um, you can, um, and there's, there's many good reasons why you might wanna outsource. Um, I think the two points I would make is, is one, um, make sure you understand what your costs are before you outsource. And, and the reason you wanna do that is you wanna know whether you're getting good value from the 3PL so you want to understand that uh, you know it costs me you know five dollars per unit. Everything I everything I touch costs me five dollars to be able to process a return, and 3PL can do it for around the same price or less, or perhaps a bit more. But I get some additional value from the 3PL. So before you outsource, make sure you understand what your costs are, or else you may be a, um, 
you know, outsourcing blind and not understanding what you're being charged for. That's number one. Number two, um, the entire process is a bit dangerous. You, know, you want to have some very strict audit guidelines in there. And that's because if a 3PL is taking your product and they're doing the uh, audit and telling you what condition the product is in, you know, condition A, B, or C, and you're being paid on the basis of what that condition is, there's a conflict there. Um, you know, not to say that uh, all 3PLs are distrustworthy. That, that's not true. But it's just if there's a conflict of them sorting the product and then paying you based on that sort, that really should be split as an audit process. Most accounting people would tell you that. So, you know, look for a 3PL who can handle all the physical handling and do all the work and give you the proper reporting that you need, perhaps with some additional reporting that you can't get in your current system. And then also look for a partner who can liquidate and that's all they do. They don't do physical handling. So they're not motivated to touch it more than once. They're motivated to sell it quickly and get you the highest price. Great, thank you. All right, and final question. Um, you talked a little bit about buyers on these B2B auction marketplaces. So where do they where do they come from, and where does B stock find find their buyers? Um, B stock has a bit of an advantage. We've been around for almost eleven years now, um, so we've got a you know very large base of buyers. Um, again, I don't have the latest statistics. Marketing might correct me on this, but it's uh, you know that's hundreds of thousands in one hundred and thirty countries. Um, so we have a, a very large database that we can dip into. So if you're coming to us and you're in the consumer electronics category, we, we likely have tens of thousands of buyers across North America that we can tap into immediately. Now, that doesn't say that we stop looking because it's extremely important to always look for new buyers. Um, and the buyers in the secondary market disappear all the time, so they need to be replaced. We have a variety of ways. So you know, we have marketing campaigns where we go out and, and target the secondary market um, based on a, a variety of sources that we get. Um, we subscribe to different uh, media sites, um, uh, reseller sites that cater to this marketplace. And, and so we'll go and try and attract buyers from there. And the third one is, is trade shows. There are trade shows out there that are dedicated to secondary market uh, buyers, people who are looking for secondary um, uh, product, secondary market product. Uh, so we go out and we attend those and we have a booth and, and we actively speak at those shows and attract people as well. So there's a variety of ways that we do that. And we also nurture them. We, our marketing group does a really good job of teaching buyers how to make more money from this, from this category or from this uh, channel, um, how to get into the business, how to market themselves. So it's all about nurturing them as well. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Paul, and thanks to everyone for taking the time to tune in today. We really appreciate it. If you have any additional questions or want to connect with Paul, feel free to email him. There's his uh, email on the screen. And I'll also plan to send a follow-up note to everyone tomorrow with the uh, presentation included. So thanks again so much for joining us, and take care. All right. Thank you.